Shabbat Shalom. All right, let's, it's good to see you and be here with you. Let's pray and get this lesson going because it's a huge one. Okay, Father, we come to you with grateful hearts this morning. We just um, thank you for this wonderful Shabbat that you have given us to just relax, to uh, put aside all the cares and work of the week, and to just concentrate on you and our relationship with you and our just concentrate on who you are, God, our great God. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. We give you all the praise and glory for what you do in our lives. And we ask now that you would teach us through your word, for it's in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, lesson eight already, somebody was asking, how many are there going to be? I honestly have no idea because there's 28 chapters in the book of Matthew, and we will get them all done. And it will be an adventure every step of the way, I guarantee you. So today, we are going to review quickly that Yeshua has now begun his ministry officially. And what has he done up until this point? He has reminded us of the importance of fulfilling righteousness. If we are not fulfilling righteousness, we are missing our call. And we're going to talk about what is righteousness anyway, and how do you fulfill it? That'll be an ongoing theme as we continue through this book, because it's critical. It's really critical. All right, so we're going to, we remember that Yeshua said, it is important for me, it is important that we fulfill all righteousness. Remember those words when he was about to be baptized, and John was saying, why am I baptizing you? I need you to baptize me, and... He said, we must fulfill all righteousness. So that's a huge statement. And then he taught us, as he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, that there will be times when we have to deny our flesh. Anybody like to do that? Oh, yeah. It's really tough, right? We don't like that. It's uncomfortable. But not eating, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he demonstrated that to us. We need to control our flesh. It's critically important, and sometimes it's painful. The, the next thing he taught us in the days prior to his public ministry was the power of the word in dealing with Satan. He spoke it right out loud, and we need to take that lesson and remember that when the enemy gets on our case, or if we are on our own case, or whatever the case is, if somebody else is on our case, <laughs> we need to proclaim the word. We need to hear ourselves saying it, and the enemy needs to hear it because it has power. Okay, so those are the things. Now Yeshua begins his public ministry, and what's the very first thing he does? It's the Sermon on the Mount. And boy, it is powerful. And we're just going to start and dive right in it today. We're going to see that um, it, the Sermon on the Mount is about how to fulfill Torah. That's what it's really, that's the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. But you're going to see it's unbelievable um, aspects of what it means to us. All right, so... We're going to see that none of the things that Yeshua was teaching were new. Absolutely not. They were not new. He was not creating a new religion. He wasn't giving new ideas. Every single concept that he's going to teach in the Sermon on the Mount is going to come from the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Okay, so Matthew 5, 1 through 3 says... And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what, are, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? If somebody asked you on the street, they said, hey, you're a Christian, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Would you have an answer for them? It's a big, huge concept that we just read about and go, okay, that's nice. Whoa, it's huge, so let's look at it. Um, it's going to involve this Hebrew word, ani, 
and the yud always means my, so we need to apply it to myself, right? Ani, poor, humble, afflicted are different ways that that word is translated. So when you see those words or those or even words with those kinds of connotations to them. Get those in your head because this is what Yeshua is saying. And he said this first. So we know it's important. The Hebrew word then can be translated in those ways. And those in this category could be widows or orphans. And they're people who are literally dependent on charity to survive. Another way of looking at this concept is to see yourself as totally needy and dependent on God. Anybody see yourself that way? As Americans, we, I hope, as Christians, we see ourselves more and more that way, especially as the day approaches, right? But as Americans or whatever nation you might be listening from, uh, you're probably taught to be independent, right? And so we kind of battle these two understandings. So are we to be independent or are we to be completely dependent? We'll keep looking at this. Okay. It means that we are to see ourselves looking to him for our sustenance, our purpose, and our welfare. It is to think of yourself as unable to survive without God. Can you see yourself that way? Poor in spirit is a place where you do not see yourself as in control, but as being totally yielded to the Lord. It is being willing to give up homes, finances, family, everything to know God and to see his kingdom grow. The poor in spirit yearn for God's presence in their lives. They pant after God as a deer pants for water. They're willing to do anything to obtain the kingdom of God. Someone said it is those who are willing to become materially poor to be spiritually rich. So, so many concepts are in there. Did any one of those stick in your brain that you can go poor in spirit means... Okay, so go back and review those because the principles that the Lord is speaking of are so huge that we can't gloss over them anymore. We're the bride getting prepared, right? We really need to know what these mean. So let one of those areas, one of those definitions or some aspect stick in your heart so that you can say, I can, I'm a deer panting after God. I yearn for him. I long to know him. His ways are all that matter to me. I have to know more of God. Those are the people that are poor, humble, and afflicted. Think of yourself as an orphan or a widow who would be totally dependent on the protection and provision of this God that we call the Messiah, our Savior. It's an amazing concept. Job repeatedly shows in his heart concerning care for the poor as a sign of righteousness. As it says, did I not weep for him whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? In Psalms, the poor or needy one is the special subject of God's care. As Psalm 34, 7 says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The prophets railed against the injustice done to the poor. Isaiah 3.14 says, What do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor. So what is the central message that you hear from these verses? Do you get a central theme from them? Yeah, we need him. We are dependent on him. And it's going to be more and more obvious as we continue to go through this Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so Matthew 5, 4, then Yeshua says, Blessed are they that mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. And that comes from, again, the Old Testament. G Yeshua is presenting nothing new here. These are all concepts from the Tanakh. Of course, there was no New Testament at this time. And he's not creating new ideas. He's showing you the heart of the Torah. Okay, so, blessed are they that mourn. Isaiah 61.3 says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You see any connections here? Everything we do should be to glorify the Lord. Everything, even mourning, because he's going to turn the mourning into something beautiful. He's going to turn it into joy. So what does it mean? The ones who mourn are more than likely those who are mourning over their sin. They, why? Everybody sins, right? They don't want to grieve the heart of God. When you sin, do you feel a mourning? I think we will more and more as the day approaches. And that's good because that'll help us turn the corner and get back to where we need to go. Okay, so then we're going to look at a couple of weeks ago, we learned that one of the titles for Messiah was the branch, right? Another title that the Messiah would be known as is Menachem right here. And it means comforter. So he came to comfort. These words are supposed to be words of comfort. Because why? It doesn't sound like if you're mourning, that's a very comforting place to be, right? Because look at what Isaiah said. If you're mourning, it's going to turn to joy. If you're mourning over sin, then you want to get rid of it because then you can go back to that total unity with the Lord. That's the whole heart of Torah. It's love so that we can put sin down and be back in that total unity with the Lord. That's the only place that we find that joy. All right, so let's keep going. Um, and of course, the Lord sent another uh, comforter that is with us always, the Holy Spirit. All right, then we're going to go on to what causes us to mourn other than sin. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's loss. Loss is a cause of mourning. When we lose someone or something that we love or cherish, we mourn. In Israel, there were so many reasons to mourn. Back in Isaiah, it says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Why would they be mourning in Zion? Because they had lost unity. They'd lost the temple. And we're going to look at those. There seemed to always be enemies that wanted Israel to be destroyed. That would be a cause for mourning, right? Whether it was the Greeks of the world who wanted to destroy with assimilation or whether it was the Hamans of the world who want to destroy with annihilation. Those are targets of hatred. And the Jewish people were targets of hatred. That would be a reason to mourn. There are more reasons. The temple was destroyed twice. Do you know what the cause of the destruction of the second temple was? And we need to get this really in our minds. It was baseless hatred baseless means there was no reason for it. And when you have baseless hatred, it destroys unity. When unity is destroyed, what's left? Nothing but destruction. Everything we do in our hearts, our heart's desire should be that everything we do with our actions is to bring unity to people so that they, in turn, can go out and unify others. It's all about bringing unity. What's the very last thing Yeshua did before he went to the cross? He prayed to the Father for unity. If there's no unity, there's nothing. If baseless hatred exists, it's going to cause destruction. That is a reason to mourn. Be really careful about that whole concept because it's so easy to get into. Do you remember how Yeshua wept when he entered Jerusalem? 
He mourned over the disunity. He wanted to gather them together, remember? If you're going to gather, you're gathering for unity. But they didn't want unity. Did they come and let him gather them? No. They said, no, thank you. We don't want that now. These are reasons to mourn. We lose something when we refuse to turn from sin and baseless hatred. We mourn over our own actions when we don't allow our inward temple to be brought back into unity with God because we don't want to deal with this or that attitude or this or that sin. Our hearts have to be changed. So do our hearts have to be changed to feel uh, poor and afflicted? Do our hearts have to be changed in order to mourn over where we might be or where we see other people? If you see other people in this condition, mourn for them. Pray for them. You know, I, very often we can't approach them, but we certainly can pray for them and we can love them and do what we can to bring them back in, right? To create unity. These are the things that the Lord is trying to get across. Now, a lot of the Jewish people would have understood that, the Gentiles that he was speaking to, because remember, he was teaching where? In Galilee of the Gentiles. That's what that area was called. That's the first place he went, and that's where up to 85% of his ministry took place. So not everybody is going to understand these concepts, but the Jewish people... If anybody does, it will be them. They'll pick it up quickly. All right, so Matthew 5.55 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, the Hebrew word for meek is anav, and I love this. It means power under control. That's a big one. And all of us can put that into action because we all have power. No question about it. All right. The meek are purposely, they purposely limit his or her, her own power and their own rights. Anybody like to limit your own rights? <laughs> you want to say what you want to say when you want to say it? It's your right, right? <laughs> well, the meek purposely limit their own power. And so where does this concept come from? Were there examples of meek people in the Bible? Numbers 12, 3 says, And the man Moses was very meek, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. And who did God choose to lead the people out of Egypt? Moses. Why? He could limit his power. He kept his power under control. And God knew that he had that heart to do that. All right. Meekness is a characteristic of the heart. Are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> it's all about our hearts. It is a heart that is not puffed up regardless of what position it has been called to or how much power he or she may have. Can you imagine the prophets who came with the very word of God to deliver to God's people. And they were hated and killed. Remember, I mean, Pastor Mark has spoken on Jeremiah time after time. And his family hated him. He had no friends. He, the other prophets of the day hated him because they wanted to bring a different message and make the people like them. But Jeremiah was faithful to the Lord and they hated him for it. He was shunned, but he was meek. He kept his power under control, even though he brought the very word of God to people. So can we be offended when we bring the word of God to people and they shun us? It's, we can't take offense to that, can we? Count it all joy. Yeah, count it all joy. It's a very difficult thing to do. So Isaiah 29, 19 says, the humble ones, that's a, that is the word anavim, which is plural for anav. You see the same root word here. This is just the plural. This is the meek ones. So these things don't show up in English because it seems like a different word. It's the same word translated differently. So the humble ones also shall increase their joy in the Lord. 
and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So where does the joy come from? It comes from God. And that's the only place, whether you're poor in spirit, whether you're poor in the flesh, um, the meek and humble ones, you're going to have the joy because his joy is going to be in you. You wonder why the world is in such bad shape? Do you wonder why so many people are, you know, having issues with uh, depression? It's all of these things. Our joy comes from doing the opposite that the world tells us. And to do what the Lord tells us, it's through being poor and afflicted and keeping our power under control. Then we're going to be filled with the joy of the Lord. These are amazing things to share with people because these are new ways of thinking. This is Torah. This is the heart of Torah. And that's what Yeshua was doing. Yeshua was meek. He was all powerful. Imagine he spoke and everything was created, all powerful. Yet he clearly said that he came to do the will of his father. He was not here for his own glory. He was power under control. Psalm 25, 9 says, the meek will he, will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. Can you be proud and learn the way of the Lord? You can't do it. The two just won't go together. Pride is going to build a wall that is going to keep you from meekness. We have to understand anything that we have has been given to us from the Lord. Any ministry, any position, any anything. God created it before we ever were born for us to walk in so that we could fulfill the works he had for us to do. They're all his works. So we have to be fulfilling the works that he put before us. You could. <laughs> yes. You have to have the one before you have the other, but they have to come together and blend. And when you have a work to do, just remember, it's not yours anyway. You're just there doing the work that he already prepared. It's his work. Zephaniah 2, 3, seek the Lord. All you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, we could go all kinds of ways with that verse, but we're not going to. I really want to point out the words seek there. What does it mean when you're seeking something? If you knew that a million dollars was hidden somewhere in this building and the first one to seek and find it got it, what would you do? You'd be out of that seat. <laughs> All your efforts would be going into finding that hiding place, right? So seeking is not just a, a nice word to put in a sentence that fills in the place that they needed a verb. No, it tells us something. It tells us an attitude that we're supposed to live life with and to pursue these characteristics, to have these characteristics in our life means that we have to go seek them. Seeking means that you desire to have something, right? When you played hide and seek as a kid, you wanted to find that person where they were. Yes, dear? Diligent, you mean diligently seeking. Diligently seeking, yes. We're gonna come to a picture here in a page or two that, that will show us something about seeking. And so Matthew 11, 28 and 29 says, "Come." this is about the Lord. Come to me, Yeshua says, all those laboring and being burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am what? Yes, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can he say that when these things are so difficult? Or are they difficult? <laughs> How does he say they're so easy? They are so easy if we're willing to lay our own selves down and get out of the way. Right? That's the hard part. That's the hard part. <laughs> okay. So in what ways did Yeshua show meekness? 
yes that's the heart of the whole issue are we doing his will and not ours then the burdens light right so simple but we make it difficult all right Matthew exactly but if he's asking us to if it's for our own humility or whatever the case may be yeah we have to say yes we have to say okay yes yes I'll do that Lord yeah I love that George thank you for bringing that out surely Yeshua on the cross was power under control he like he said he could have called for legions of angels right but he didn't power under control huge concept righteousness Matthew 5 6 blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled if you hunger and thirst for something if you haven't had something to drink and eat for a day or two let's say two days no water nothing no liquids no foods uh, are you gonna really seek something to drink and eat if you're healthy and feeling well of course you are you're gonna go after it with all your might right uh, yes, because you're going to really need it. Okay, so the promise here is great. If you hunger and thirst for these things, you're going to be filled with them. You're not just going to get a little bit, not just a sprinkle or a drop. You're going to be filled. So you get what you are pursuing, and that's the real huge thing here. Pursuing takes effort. And as you look at the picture on page six, this guy is pursuing something. It's, it, a picture is worth a thousand words. Page yes. Five, page, five. page five. Oh, okay. It's page five on your notes. It's six on mine. Sorry about that. Page five. Um, so does he look like he's in pursuit? Yes. Or somebody's in pursuit of him? <laughs> 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 we're just going to say he's in pursuit. So um, where did this concept of righteousness come from? It came again from the Jewish scriptures. Proverbs 10, 6 and 7, 11 and 25 says, Blessings are on the head of the righteous. The memory of the righteous is blessed. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. So who wants to be righteous? I mean, hello, the blessings are just incredible. Isaiah 32, 17 says, The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and assurance forever. Remember, Elizabeth and Zechariah were called righteous. And this was before the birth of Yeshua. That's a huge concept that we have to remember. That was before Yeshua was even born. Okay, so what does that tell us? Was there righteousness and a way to obtain it then? Yes, because God doesn't change, right? So this was a concept that the Jewish people were familiar with, and it was attainable. For these people are specifically mentioned as being righteous. Remember, Anna and Simeon were also called righteous, and they were waiting for the Messiah. Uh, Simeon had been promised that he would see the Messiah before he died, and he was way up in his 80s. So, okay. Wasn't the same true with Abraham because of his obedience, that he was, it was credited to him as righteousness? Yes, yes, yes. So righteousness has been there, but we kind of tend to think of it as a New Testament concept, not at all. It's a definitely, Yeshua is teaching right out of the Torah. Righteousness is a state of the heart that yearns to be like God. That's what righteousness is, and to do his ways. This is what we are pursuing. Can you picture your heart being like this gentleman in that picture? running after righteousness, trying to overtake it with everything you have and everything you are, that's pursuing righteousness. It isn't that we're going to be perfect. Righteous people's actions are not always perfect. But if that guy tripped and fell, he is so in pursuit of whatever it is that's up there ahead of him, he's going to pick himself right back up 
and keep pursuing. And that's what righteousness does. It isn't perfection. It is when you stumble, you get up and you keep pursuing righteousness. Okay. Righteousness, and if you can remember this, it is a life-changing thing. Righteousness is about an association with the Messiah. It's not on your notes. We are to be so closely associated with the Messiah that when people look at you, they see Yeshua. That's how close our relationship with the Messiah, our association with him has to be. That's pursuing righteousness. Okay. All right. A little change up here. When the rabbis taught, they often used a technique called call ve omer, and that meant light and heavy. So what does this mean? If it was a light commandment, uh, it would be like the mother bird and the babies. You are never to remove a baby from in front of the mother, right? That would be a light commandment. Uh, the heavy commandment on the other end would be honor your father and mother. Okay, so light and heavy commandments. I'm gonna, we're going to look at an example of this in Matthew 5, 19 and 20. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these, that would be a light commandment. That's what Yeshua is teaching. He's using rabbinical methods as he's teaching here and teaches men so shall be called least, lightest, they'll be the lightest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, now this is the comparison of the heavy stuff. So if, you're, if you do the lightest thing, you're going to be light in heaven. If you do the heaviest things, like he tells us to do, make, make students, right? Make Talmudim, go make disciples, then you're going to be heavy in heaven. So he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See the comparison? For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That seems like a bit too much for people to do, right? Because on the outside, it looked like the scribes and Pharisees did everything perfectly. Well, who can do that? But Yeshua is talking about hearts here. Everything originates in the heart because later, do you remember that he called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? Why? It's another call the Omer teaching, light and heavy, because they counted the mint, the dill, and the cumin. They counted every little leaf of every little spice, right? That would be the light side. But they forgot mercy and justice. That would be the heavy side. So what they were showing to people on the outside, oh, we count every little leaf. The Lord says, you're hypocrites. You're hypocrites. You're, you're showing everybody that you're doing these light things, but you're forgetting the heart of the issue, which is mercy and justice. Okay? So, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. I have, okay. Everyone is in need of mercy, and this verse is showing us a unique perspective on mercy. When you extend mercy, you are blessed because mercy will come back to you. All right. Remember in Exodus, um, God comes to the mountain to marry the people, and he's given the ten words of the ten commandments, and they're the ketubah for the wedding ceremony, right? This day, God was showing his people the love in his heart. And what do they do? And I'm not going to read the whole thing because time is going to escape us. But what they do is they say, oh, stay away, God. You're too scary. The people all turn around, leave, go and build the golden calf, right? And God sees that they've done this right after he's married these people. His heart is broken. He says, I'm going to take them all out. Moses says, no, don't do that. So what does God do? God chose mercy. And we know this because even though he wanted to destroy them, 
he comes down and he proclaims his attributes to them. And the 13 attributes begin with the word Adonai. Adonai means Lord or Master. The Yud at the end means my Lord or my Master. But what's even am more amazing about this is that they believe the word Adonai actually replaced the Yud He Vav He, which is the sacred name too sacred to pronounce. So at some point in time, they believe that this was replaced with the Yud He Vav He. And Adonai, and yud heh vav -Hey stands for mercy, the merciful God, right? As compared to Elohim. So now, the very first thing that the Lord proclaims when he proclaims the 13 attributes that are his, he says, Adonai, I'm that God. I have overflowing mercy. Not only does he say it once, he says it twice. So he's saying, God knows we are frail and we will sin. He is the merciful God. The second time, God will forgive the sinner. He is the merciful God, overflowing with mercy. The third thing he calls himself is El. El is the word for God, like El Shaddai, all of those kinds of names of God. He starts with El. Okay, that name proclaims that he is all-powerful. But it also shows that his mercy surpasses his power. That is huge. So when he says El Shaddai, that is telling you that this all-powerful God who supplies everything, Shaddai, the provision, our provider, his provision his, is abundant for everybody, right? But his mercy exceeds his provision. Okay. Those are the first three names or attributes that God proclaims about himself. And when does he do this? After they've broken his heart with the sin of the golden calf. That right there shows you that these names are true, right? The, the fourth one he gives us, and we can't go any further, is Rakamim or compassionate. And where do I have Rakamim? Right here. And notice that this word rakamim, if you have the yud mem at the end, it always means plural. It's not just that he is, is mercy, is that he is mercies. His name is rakamim. And it's so cool because the root word of rakamim is underlined here for you. It's raham. Raham is a womb. There's no more compassionate place on the universe than a womb right? Everything that baby needs is in that womb. Everything that he needs for life. Um, and I don't care how uncomfortable a mother is during a pregnancy, and everybody is uncomfortable during a pregnancy at some point in time. And even the stronger those little kicks get every time they kick you in the ribs and it hurts, you're just loving that baby and blessing that baby, and you can't wait to see it, right? Every mom feels that. That's the kind of mercies that the Lord feels as though we're in his womb of mercy. It's amazing. Okay, so you can't outdo his mercy. This is the kind of mercy he's asking us to show toward others. Whoa. Okay, that's huge. Can we do that to our enemies? It's tough, but this is what he's saying. This is the heart of Torah. All right, Matthew 4. 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So pure in heart um, is a huge phrase, <laughs> and it really means one who is in harmony with God. If you have a pure heart, your heart is going to be in harmony with God. Do you know, does, everybody loves to hear beautiful harmonies in music, right? But when somebody's off key, what's it do to you? Ooh, it's like people are running their fingers down the chalkboard, right? We don't like it when things are off key. Well, God doesn't either. And that's why he's saying pure in heart. Then you're in harmony with God. Okay, and you'll notice, where is this word? Right here. The first letter in front of this word 
is, is Lamed, and that stands for shepherd. And notice how closely it's attached to the word bara, which is pureness. The first two letters of this word are heart, lev. This word with the three letters is pure. And you cannot have a pure heart unless you are in constant contact with the shepherd. Constant. Isn't that amazing how that Hebrew language works? You have to be in constant contact with him. A heart that is being rejuvenated and cleansed by the shepherd is a pure heart in harmony with him. Yes? You have bar, uh, bet resh, in the middle mm -hmm. of your word you're talking about there, and that means son. Yes, and it also means pure. <laughs> oh, wow. Isn't that amazing? What a joy. I know. And if you do it backwards, it's behold the son who is pure, the shepherd. <laughs> Pretty incredible God we serve. <laughs> All right. Psalm 24, 4 and 5 says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The pure in heart will see God. That's what we all want, right? We all want to stand before him and hear, enter the joy of my kingdom, you good and faithful servant, right? All right, so um, we still have peacemakers to go, and I don't think we're going to get through it. But um, let's try. Matthew, blessed, Matthew uh, 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And where did this concept come from? Every single one of these came from the Tanakh. Okay. And so Psalm 34, 11 through 14 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, that's probably the hardest thing we do, and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and what? Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And what does it look like when you're pursuing something? Okay, and then there, the next thing is uh, the word shalom, which we just aren't going to have trouble for or time for. But... Um, if you could summarize these in a phrase or a sentence or even a word, what would you say? I'd say it pictures what <coughs> Christ is looking for in his bride. Yes. And where does it begin? It all begins in our heart. And it all has to do with our relationship, how close we are the, to the Messiah. Our association with him should be so close that when people look at us, they see Yeshua. And we're going to go into that further in some other lessons. And I think you'll love it when we get to the uh, teaching about salt and light later this week or next week. And you guys have a blessed, wonderful week. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs>